Hello, this is Rick Harnish. I'm the executive director of the High Speed Rail Alliance. And I wanna thank you all very much for uh, coming. Uh, uh, we've got an exciting program today about station usage. Um, and we've got some issues like this around the country in terms of balancing passenger versus commercial uses of the station. Um, very excited to see this presentation. And I wanna say, I was in Berlin Hauptbahnhof, which is in this picture, just this past September. The stations, the, the stores in it were busy. The station was busy and the high-speed trains were sold out. It was an exciting place to be. And it was great to be able to run through the station, grab my dinner and get on a high-speed train for Frankfurt and be ready to go. Uh, so we've got a really exciting program. First, a little bit about us. Uh, the High Speed Rail Alliance is a nonprofit where our focus is on education. We strive to be the most knowledgeable source on what high speed rail is, why we need it in this country, and what steps individuals like yourself and local leaders can take to help make it happen. Um, we are working for a national railroad program that high speed rail plays a major part in where we imagine that about 20% of the vision network would be new high speed lines and about 80% would be high frequency service on shared use lines and high frequency could change. Um, if you're in uh, the Midwest, it's at least 16 trains a day. If you're in Montana, it's at least three or four trains a day. Uh, with, but in order to understand how this all fits together, we need a national plan put together by the Federal Railroad Administration, and that needs to roll up individual state plans done by states. And the only state to do such a plan so far is California, um, and we will uh, we will talk about that frequently. So again, exciting program today. Very glad to have you. If you like this program, if you want to see more like it. Uh, we are supported by you, the listener. Uh, so please go to highspeedrail.us and hit the donate button or the join button and uh, help ensure that we can continue to grow these programs. We've got some exciting ones on tap, um, including Maglev. Um, and uh, so please go to highspeedrail.us and make a donation. Now I'd like to introduce Chris Ott, our deputy director up in Madison in order to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick, and thank you all for coming today. We've benefited this year from several really good talks from Deutsche Bahn, and we have two more DB speakers today. Uh, Augustine Aristi is principal senior consultant on station planning and operations with Deutsche Bahn ECO North America. He is also station design lead on the California High Speed Rail Authority Early Train Operator, or ETO. Mr. Aristi holds two Master of Science degrees in engineering and architecture, and for the last 15 years, he has led design teams on major rail infrastructure projects. Uh, this work includes coordinating multidisciplinary engineering designs that focus on transit stations, as well as transit-oriented development on different rail networks. Mr. Aristi has worked on projects including Spanish high-speed rail segments, the second cross-rail transit S-Bahn commuter system for Munich, the new on-express GO transit commuter system in the greater Toronto area, and the Qatar integrated rail project in the Emirates of Qatar, which has delivered a rail network with 37 metro stations for the FIFA World Cup that's being held there this month. And our second speaker uh, is Ricky Estrada, a DB consultant for the California Authority's early train operator. Mr. Estrada holds a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics and business management. He started his career in marketing and operations, uh, including supporting local entities with focus groups and research for product and project testing. In 2018, he joined the DB early train operator team when it had only three employees. Uh, that project now has more than 270 experts, and he has helped to drive a variety of ETO work products, including development of the ridership and revenue model, a tool to estimate fare sensitivity among user groups, focus groups to determine the needs and wants at future stations, and executing a study to consider user preferences in the interior design of the rolling stock. 
Currently, Mr. Estrada is supporting the development of California high-speed rail stations, including station site planning, operational requirements, and costing analysis. If you, uh, if you, the members of our audience, have comments, please put them in the chat. And if you have a question, please use Zoom's Q&A button, because that helps us to find the questions quickly and get to as many as we can after the, uh, the main talk. And with that, let me turn things over to our speakers. Thank you. Thanks, Chris and, and Rick, for the introduction. Um, so I'll be guiding you guys through our presentation. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yes, Chris? Yes. Can, yes. yes. OK, perfect. So yeah, obviously, today we're going to be talking about, so the big question, what are, what are train stations really for? And underneath that, we're going to try to kind of set the stage and, and describe some station purposes, but also give you guys an inside look at, at some case examples of uh, what has worked and also what tends to not work at the end. Uh, so with that, DB is serious about uh, stations. So DB actually operates more than 5,000 stations, 5,600 stations. That amounts to over 10.7 million square feet of rental space. Uh, over 3,000 commercial tenants, 5,000 employees, and um, different op train operators that use the stations as well, with over 19 million of passengers per day. A lot of figures here to just to, to really make it clear that it, it's quite an operation and it's quite an undertaking. Um, you know, so I, I, I mentioned that I come from, I'm, I'm here, I'm a local employee, but I, I got a chance to experience this. And, and truly, if you haven't experienced the that just the network of high-speed rail, um, you know, service in, in Germany and, and parts of Europe, it's it's quite fascinating. Augustine, do you do you have anything that you would also like to mention here? No, it's important to mention maybe uh, on the figure of 19 to 20 million passengers and visitors a day, that every single working day, just two, up to, I would say between two and three million passengers will be really be uh, in purpose of riding the system, while many others use the station just as a, a point of contact, as a meeting point, as a place to shop or to uh, work or to take uh, some advantage of many services, amenities that the new trend of modernized stations on the high-speed rail uh, tracks and networks provide to the, to the public. So for 20, 30 years, we have been uh, experiencing a trend in a modernization of stations that uh, provide beyond the mobility, traditional mobility services, far more other services that applies to a better customer and uh, riders oriented uh, services. This is interesting to uh, uh, stress out because part of the presentations today will refer to this customer oriented um, um, strategy that uh, st uh, rail stations pursue for, for now and for the uh, coming future. Thank you. Thank you, Augustine. So let's talk about and, and what I what I what we did here is kind of break down four different classifications of stations and and you know we can kind of mention what a station's purpose really is by by classifying them. So one type of station is like a kiss and ride station. The main purpose here is to reduce congested highways, and the focus is really on drivability and um, and and making it as easy for the passengers as possible. Uh, to to get and then to ride uh, the specific at that specific station. The second category is a nodal station. This is in general to provide connectivity, and the focus here is for rail technical operational efficiency. Third is for urban development. This is really the focus is on development, and it's for new development and reducing pressure in critical urban zones uh, and, and cities. Urban developers are the focus here, how you integrate those developers and the last mile focus for the passengers. So how are they able to get to their destination, the last mile focus. Lastly, and quite possibly my favorite, is this is the station as a destination. So this is really where the customer the customer comes to focus um, with regards to how they view it as a place. How do they spend time there at the station without necessarily traveling? And obviously how that customer will will then spend uh, on different so either services there or different amenities. The focus here is the sense of place 
uh, the walkability score, and also the services provided at these stations. We have an example um, that we will be looking at, which is the Berlin station. And this, we can, we can kind of uh, describe that. But first, I'm also going to touch on the vision of stations. I mentioned the four uh, sort of key components and classifications of stations, but even throughout that, it's important that when you are developing a station that you recognize that stations are really entry points and exit points uh, for the railway system. How are they tied to the community? How are you building that station? So even that you have the different classification, these are things that should definitely be in focus during the development of the station. Uh, we mentioned customer focus, but there's also things, if you look forward into the future, such as digitalization and how the customer will be interacting with the station, not just uh, physically, but also through their smartphone and through different technology. Uh, connectability and accessibility, that was touched obviously with, with the Kiss and Ride station. How, how are, are people able to, to uh, get to their last mile destination? So it's an important thing to, to focus on, you know, ride share, uh, different modes of, of getting to their place, whether it be bike rentals or scooters, things like that. And um, how safe is it? Um, again, if the station is a place, you, you definitely want it to feel safe for the passengers. Uh, you want it to be a secure environment. DB has done studies and, and maybe Augustine, uh, you can touch a little more on it. Um, but things, things that are trivial to, at least they were trivial to me, things such as lighting, uh, the placement of lights or, or even uh, the, the surroundings, how you, how you perceive your situation, how open the station tends to be, can actually impact how the passengers uh, feel safe and secure. Um, there's also a focus on identity and community. This starts from the development stage. Uh, currently, Augustine and I, obviously, we, we're working on the California High Speed Rail project, and it's something that is that is called early side activation, and we're focused on, you know, how are we able to integrate the community at an early stage, whether that be, you know, events to to get the community on site to touch ground at where the future station will be. I think it's important to note, and, and Augustine might have a different perspective, uh, having grown up with high speed rail. I'm a California native. I, I, I obviously I'm not growing up with high speed rail, so it's something. And several Californians also, uh, we're we're open to alternative transportation. But how do you get the people who haven't grown up with it uh, to to adopt it and to to embrace it rather in integrating into their lives? Um, the next pillar of sustainability. As you do uh, start to develop a station, how how do you keep conscious, uh, you know, eco an eco friendly station truly, or, or one that doesn't have such an impact uh, on the environment, but rather can also help um, entrepreneurial spirit. So this is this is with regards to how when you're developing, how do you make it a economically sustainable station, obviously, and how do how can you increase uh, ancillary revenues, and lastly. The flexibility and long-term governance of the station. Augustine, anything that you would like to add uh, to these? No, you covered pretty points. much. No, thank you very much. You covered almost all the aspects. I think uh, that's uh, enough for for the vision. For uh, I would say, thank you. Great. Okay. So uh, again very very technical to kind of split uh, stations into their different main areas and focus on one side you have um, the the track side which is uh, focusing on the the tracks platforms circulation tunnels and lifts kind of the more technical operation side of things uh, rail state rail systems technical rooms and path and pa systems you also have logistically uh, the, the land side area so this is where you have the waiting areas restrooms ticketing, all sort of customer facing services and information. And then lastly, the forecourt. So this would be obviously where that, um, the, the public areas or where things such as the bike and car shares are located, customer retail potentially and uh, walkability, or the focus on walkability. Uh, Augustine, perhaps you can talk about DB setup here and how uh, these separate segments are managed from, from a technical point. Uh, sure. Um, I think this uh, slide is quite valuable as it shows in three verticals the three different areas where classically and typically the station is divided, a genuine operational uh, of the minimum valuable product that we provide 
maybe also when we talk when we talk about phasing and the day one of operation what has to do with platforms and the daily boarding and alighting procedures at stations and this is particularly interesting when you start high speed rail uh, uh, network for for for, for new uh, uh, from scratch, you can see that probably uh, this first vertical as the minimum product that you have to put in place for operating the network. Uh, but uh, when uh, operations go into the next phase of uh, build out, uh, you might think of the opportunities to go into the section two or mid mid uh, median uh, vertical that we see here, where amenities and other customers oriented services might be added to the most genuine operation uh, need. For that purpose, Germany has considered different uh, companies that operate the different areas of operation separately. So it's a kind of uh, an umbrella at the DB holding company AG, who had then uh, diverts uh, the different responsibilities and areas of competency among their subsidiaries uh, uh, and affiliate firms. Um, and finally, we have uh, the uh, vertical on the right, which has a kind of a reaction, a dialogue with the surrounding neighboring uh, communities where the station needs to interact and get uh, all the best as a win-win reaction and a good relationship between uh, both areas, the station forecourt as a place where uh, residents and other uh, uh, people benefit from the situation that the station is in their district, in their area, in this, uh, and uh, the station uh, benefits as well from those uh, uh, initiatives, both public as private. Uh, so business cases, projects, entities, uh, um, well, companies, um, but also municipalities and uh, public uh, entities might also be uh, here in the call to create uh, a rich uh, dialogue between the uh, network and the surroundings to benefit both from economical developments and uh, opportunities uh, for, for, for all the partners involved in, in the process. And this certainly appears to happen further down the road when operations are settled, where people identify the station already uh, as a, uh, a highly contribution to their customer journeys and their amenities. So the next last built out phase will be when the station really operates within the urban fabric and the uh, urban realm of the station, of the city, sorry, or area which uh, it serves. Thank you. Thanks, Augustine. Okay. So now we're going to take a look at uh, the Berlin station. And this, the Berlin station is a nodal station and a destination. So it has kind of two shared classifications. Um, the, the site area is 1.1 million square feet. The project total cost was over 800, almost 900 million. And it is Europe's largest station. It is not by volume the busiest station, correct, Augustine? I believe it's it's fourth in, in the rank, um, but it does serve as a central node and it is a busy station um, in all four cardinal uh, directions. We have a map here. Uh, perhaps, Augustine, you can also give some insight as to what really Berlin's, Berlin kind of serves as, 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 a, as a piece in, in Germany. Yeah, we don't want to be too exhaustive here referring to the geography and position of Berlin, but maybe just for a hint, and at first glance, you might see here continuous lines in different colors, which uh, resemble the ICE or high speed rail connections to Germany from the north to the south, from east to west, and uh, interim uh, wise as well. Uh, so Berlin is connected to the high speed rail to the west mainly, but the, you also see their uh, dotted lines to the north, to the south, and to uh, the east and west for regional trains uh, uh, in different colors. It re reflects uh, the headways. So red color will be one hour headway of train services, and blue the two hours headway. So you have properly speaking in Berlin, hundreds of uh, trains and uh, network services uh, serving not only the Berlin area, but also all the state of Berlin, Brandenburg, and beyond that, 
all the uh, well domestic uh, connections to uh, the different uh, other transportation hubs like Hamburg in the north or Munich in the south or Frankfurt in the middle or Cologne to the west and also uh, the international connections uh, beyond borders in the European Union or Union uh, towards France, Poland to the east, uh, Nordic uh, countries to the north, and certainly also the southern uh, countries to uh, to the south, like Italy. Thank you. And Austria. Augustine. And Augustine, it's not just high speed rail service, correct? That, that you can you can get at the Berlin station, but also rather these different connecting services. Transportation at uh, Berlin station is an integrated system, a hub where uh, you see uh, well, more than two to 300 trains arriving and departing every single day. As you see on the bottom, uh, an image of these white uh, train sets, which are resembling the, the high-speed rail uh, services, the so-called ICEs. But on the left, you see also regional trains uh, branded in red. And on top, you will see on the right, the yellow Berlin characteristic uh, uh, sub um, a tube uh, and on the west, the commuter rails and uh, streetcars. So it's an uh, overall integrated service on a through-go station, uh, which serves not only the city and the districts of a very wide range uh, areas around Berlin, but also the overall state of Berlin Brandenburg. And beyond that, all, as I mentioned before, the uh, state connections for high-speed rail and international uh, uh, network services to the adjacent countries in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Augustine. And to kind of give you guys an inside view and outside kind of bird's eye view of the Berlin station, mention that it is also a station as a destination. And um, so while you can see, you know, different different shops and things of that nature on the left hand side, on the outside, you might might think, All right, why would why would you want to hang out around, you know, just just a, a kind of concrete? But what you can see there is the river, and then the green area. Uh, and when I visited Berlin Station, it was a very kind of an exciting place to be. On they, on that lawn, they have you know chairs. You can watch the the the, the boats go by. Um, you know, the, different kayakers and things. So it's it's very you know it's a place where people do want to be. They have you know obviously their beer gardens outside and things like that. So it was interesting for me to finally see, okay, that's that's what it truly means to be a station as a destination uh, and, and somewhere where people actually want to be, if it's even if they're not traveling or their end goal is to get on a train. It's maybe worth to mention that the station highly contributed to develop all the governmental district around the station at the same time and timely uh, parallel to also the housing and uh, accommodations that they for for work and offices, buildings that were developed uh, while the station was also constructed. So it's kind of a, a joint effort and team up uh, of uh, initiatives and funding to make everything uh, start and operate and interact uh, uh, timely uh, for, for the purpose of the station, uh, for the purpose of the city where, uh, that the station is serving to. Thank you. Now to just kind of give you a breakdown of the inside of the Berlin station. It's comprised of shops and, and gastronomies or so restaurants around 162,000 square feet, offices, which are a larger portion, 540,000 square feet, the railway operations, 162,000 square feet, circulation and platforms, both amounting to roughly 580,000 square feet, and then parking space, which is uh, 270,000 square feet. Um, the materials used for the station, concrete, steel, and glass materials. They also have solar panels integrated into the glass roof as an attempt to, to make the station a bit more eco-friendly. Eco now to give you guys again kind of a um, inside-outside focus and, and, and dive into exactly uh, what is special about the Berlin station. So outside, um, we'll point now to the, to the concrete, kind of the flat um, section which is a, a pedestrian square. And from there, passengers or customers can also have access to multiple hotels, which are very conveniently located, as well as access, Augustine mentioned, to S-Bahn, U-Bahn, and even, even taxis. Inside, 
what you have at the level zero main entrance, uh, entrance is an informational desk for customer assistance and guidance. This is crucial, Having speaking from experience um, and, and coming to what was my first high speed rail station, um, <laughs> at least for me, I, I was lost. Uh, and we will get to a second point, which I will focus on digital, digitalization. Uh, that makes it very easy. But but these uh, customer assistance areas are definitely helpful. I'm sure, I'm not sure, honestly, much more for foreigners like my like myself coming into the station. Um, there are also multiple luggage lockers, ATMs, and different Wi-Fi access points within the station. And of course, several places to eat and drink uh, with recognizable, recognizable brands, uh, which are not local there in, in Germany, but even a supermarket inside the station. The uh, something different, and I think something important to note is that at the Berlin Central Station, you also have these co-working spaces. This is something, again, as, as you start to think about a station and how you can integrate it into the customer or the passenger's life is um, starting to think about, you know, how can we enhance or, or reduce the inefficient time that someone is waiting at a station maybe for their journey and kind of integrate the concept here. We have WeWork uh, into a station. Um, so, so you see that they do have these, these different co-working spaces, including in the middle, you see they're kind of more private uh, co-working spaces that you can rent or, or just where you can take calls and things of that nature and sort of a more um, kind of business lounge type, type view. Augustine, anything that you wanted to mention here? No, fine. And you just captured the different offers that the, well, this is a service that the Berlin is running for, uh, for not so much of time. I think it's uh, one year and they are expanding the, 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 the offers to different uh, types of clients from a one hour uh, booking uh, of a seat with uh, Wi-Fi access to a team of five uh, using the station for regular services office uh, times uh, for a month or even for half a year. So there's a wide range of customers applying for that and uh, it's pretty much booked up to on working days up to 80% of the capacity. So it's really a good uh, response from the public and from the customers on this uh, initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Augustine. And so I mentioned um, having my, my experience at Berlin Station and, and feeling a bit lost and then coming to the customer assistance booths. Um, and one of the things that really, I think, saved me or, or was really helpful to me, and this ties back into the digitalization, is the use of the DB Navigator app. So this is kind of catch-all app to plan your trips and to buy your tickets. And so this is just kind of a, a little view or snippet of, of uh, what you can do. And it's not just high speed that you can buy your tickets, but also the different connecting uh, service tickets. The DB Bonhoeff Live application, this is useful once you're in the station to be able to navigate it. If you feel lost or you're trying to find you know, a coffee shop or where the different lifts are or where uh, you know, access points or restrooms are, this is just ultimately a definitely a staple for passenger convenience at the station and a, go a good supplement. Augustine, I'll hand it to you to kind of talk about now operations and, and thinking about how, how DB approaches with their with their 3S concept. Sure. Uh, if we concentrate on the left side of this slide, we will see our kind of a core and very genuine service uh, center for the customers that we have been successfully implemented for decades in our stations, not only high speed rail stations, but also commuter stations in Germany. So, Brabus um, operations run basically uh, based on our um, yeah, understanding that the customers are uh, definitely uh, uh, not only uh, monitored, but also assisted and uh, guided throughout the facility. So for that purpose, uh, the 3S central uh, control room, which uh, speaks for the 3S in German, means uh, service, safety, and cleanliness. Uh, as cleanliness in German it starts also with an S. <laughs> uh, um, uh, it really allows to uh, check uh, every single spot of the station that works uh, well or doesn't. So the reaction time and the re uh, activity of our um, operational and maintenance crew staff members might be uh, uh, key 
to react and respond on the needs on the spot in real time uh, for our passengers. So partial, uh, platform marshals, uh, instant uh, cleaning uh, staff uh, members, and also uh, um, security uh, staff uh, uh, look into uh, yeah, our 16 to 20 hours operational time uh, revenue times at the stations to guarantee and safeguard that passengers get not stranded, lost, uh, or somehow uh, got into hazards. This might be uh, one of our uh, key uh, elements that we'd like also to export and to present to other networks as it has proved very valuable and successful over uh, and over again. On the right side, maybe just a glimpse uh, and a quick uh, um, uh, in view in the, uh, this graphic uh, showing uh, well, uh, the um, visualization of the Berlin station on top and on the bottom in gray, uh, the platform areas on the bottom uh, for the high-speed rail, on the top for regional and uh, commuter rails. As you may see, all the platforms are clear, are uh, separated from all the other services, clean and neat without any obstructions, easily visualized and accessible from all the passengers while in the intermediate station and Berlin station has uh, five to six depends a little bit on the situation, uh, stories, high building, will have um, all the other back of house area, which are here meant in red and in yellow, and also all the commercial uh, services, but also the information and customers oriented amenities in between. So on your way, from high speed rail drop off zone into the commuter for your final transferring into your final destination. You will go across uh, different uh, walkways and circulation areas to provide you with the right shopping, the right uh, information and assistance that you might need while transferring from one mode into another. Thank you. So now I think we kind of Kind of cut sections and we'll talk about a case study specifically of what worked with uh, development and, and sort of some keys to success. And Montebauer, uh, the high speed rail station in Montebauer, is a good example of that as far as the use of the urban development measure that allows for priority development and financing. Um, this includes upfront public investment. This is where the city truly acts as the developer. And the city also partners with an outside development agency to support um, the development occurred in phases and adjustments to the plan and uses over time. Uh, and the mayor and city council really supported the project throughout from start to finish, despite a lot of challenges. And I think this is this is something really key. You want to you want to have some, uh, you know, the, the political side is difficult. Yes, uh, for, for any project. But I think, you know, one where there is undisputed support, it's, it's very important to making the project a success. And then lastly, the long-term partnership with uh, their private developer. And you can kind of see for Montebauer, the, the, the highlight is pretty jarring. So you see on one side, yes, they have some housing development, uh, but then you can see a complete shift in, in 2016. Not sure if you can see my cursor, but every, all of the development that happened within the station here and then on the outside completely. And now I'll highlight what didn't work, which is the Limburg station. And here you can see where, where sometimes the development doesn't, doesn't, uh, is not quite successful or, or things really just do not catch. Um, you can see that a green field stays green. So you see largely in part from 2011 to 2021, almost same time frame. really there's been almost no, no development uh, here. So Augustine, anything? to kind of add to that case study? Uh, yeah, maybe, uh, Ricky, just for the context of the audience, it's worth to say that we have moved off, geographically speaking, from Berlin, a very uh, successful and a very uh, high densified and, 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 and transportation hub to a high-speed rail network track. Uh, the first actually in Germany operating between the cities of Cologne and Frankfurt. And on this track, 
most of uh, mainly on the mid center point between the two uh, identified cities, uh, this area of part of our and limbo two intermediate stops were identified. It's important maybe to put this in context because in the US as we will starting uh, 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 aligning and proving uh, opportunities for intermediate station between uh, high densified uh, hubs as uh, for example, in the Central Valley between San Francisco and Los Angeles for the California high-speed rail network. Uh, the question rise, uh, how much of that, uh, these intermediate stops and stations and cities benefit from the network that uh, is passing by. And it depends a lot on the interaction between the authority and the local municipalities to create value and to see opportunities to uh, benefit both sides from those uh, infrastructure investment that are high, costly, and long-term. So you see here a range of time between 1997 and 2016. So it's almost 20 years uh, where the city and all the agents and uh, stakeholders here benefited from both sides and created a focal point for business, for investment, for factories to work uh, it out to make uh, this area richer, wealthier, and for us, for more uh, opportunities for the for the public and for the residents. And it depends very much, and as you mentioned, Ricky, on the attitude and the prerogatives that uh, are keen uh, to find out a way to interact between the in highly invested uh, infrastructure and the consequence that might arise or the opportunity that might uh, come up uh, by interacting and stakeholder uh, uh, stakeholding uh, between the parties. Thank you. Great. So I actually think, Augustine, that that wraps us up. Um, I guess we can open it for for questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Can Can you do me a favor and go back to the German map? Uh, it's not totally related to the presentation, but I wanted to make sure right there. This one? Yeah. So um, if you look down there, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, student talk, right? Uh, so that's hourly service. So those thick lines, they have a train at least every hour. Um, and then the dashed lines are trains every two hours. Correct. And, the, the base network meets at key nodes um, at the same time every hour. So that this is part of making high-speed lines, um, you know, part of a network as opposed to just thinking about city pairs. So that's, that's a really important point uh, in general, I, I, not specifically I, about this presentation. Yes, actually, Rick, uh, if you look deeper, closer to it, uh, for the red lines, you have a three kind of, of lines. As you mentioned, the, the dash, it's a two, uh, zwei Stunden tag, so uh, a two hours uh, sequence or, or, or timeline. Then you have the, the continuous thin line, which is the, the one hour uh, I, ICE or high speed rail uh, um, Headway, and then you have the thick continuous line, which uh, appear, uh, appeals to uh, to a two uh, uh, trains per hour uh, service. So that's better, right? Yeah, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> so, in well populated regions like the Midwest or around the Atlanta hub. Um, Portland to Seattle, we should have a minimum service requirement uh, that's at least hourly or perhaps two hourly, but two an hour is very good. And the California system um, is doing that in their California plan, which I mentioned before, they've got the, this regular interval service in their long range plan and high-speed rail makes it possible to do that and having easy connections at the stations between the different lines um, is critical to making that work. Um, I also have a question. So I've been to Lindbergh um, and it's clear that the station was not built in downtown Lindbergh because of the 
um, geography. So, so Lindbergh is actually in a valley um, and the high speed line doesn't go down into the valley. It's got a bridge going over it. Uh, but there is a connecting bus service that is free. Uh, so this, on my past trip, I did take the train here, catch a connecting bus to the downtown Lindbergh station, and then took backtrack to take a train to walk to a place just south of here. Um, so I think that's part of the answer as to why this didn't develop as much as folks thought it might. Um, and it looks like the Monteberg station um, is right next to the main area. And so it's better tied in with the main economic area for that city. Is that correct? Or is there something else going on? No, certainly this might help. But when it comes to stations or stops located in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in between the center point of two major transportation hubs where there is a limited uh, interaction between uh, origin and destination by itself. So you have to create in such uh, an environment uh, and uh, the so-called ex-urban stations, which have to run uh, separately and independently from the influence or area of catchment of the origin and destination. So you have to figure out what kind of uh, nature and uh, uh, point of destination of point of interest uh, might arise here. And certainly, both of them are not uh, uh, considered to be a, a place for uh, for housing or for uh, uh, settlements, but rather, uh, as in the case of Montabaur, a place for uh, outsourcing uh, and uh, purchasing and land banking, uh, land for a business and uh, um, factories. And this was the case, for example, in, in Montabaur, where there was a success story behind that, not so much for uh, housing or for amenities or for entertainment or for other uses of tourism, but rather just uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, locating and uh, providing uh, uh, a kind of uh, uh, working hub, uh, uh, which uh, it's linked to a very high densified uh, uh, and, and, and speedy uh, uh, way of transportation and connection. So this uh, might uh, be also interesting when we are uh, uh, looking into stations orbiting uh, around or in between, uh, for example, here in, in Pande, which is north from LA, where we see there really a, a good opportunity to buy uh, 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 land and to accommodate factories and services in a more uh, affordable way that we would uh, think in, uh, in, in in the San Francisco Bay Area or in the LA Basin. And then they benefit really from this network in a way that uh, uh, operates well in both sides. So people can reach out and commute and, and reach out this area for working or for entertainment or for housing. In this particular case, it's more for, for working. Uh, and why Limbo didn't work it, uh, so far uh, so, so good as what? Well, we think that there was uh, less uh, involvement and uh, interaction between the, the stakeholders as it happened in, in, in the previous sample of Montabaur, but uh, nothing that not, uh, can be done uh, in the future, learning lessons learned from, from what had happened and what was a, a success uh, story in, in other places. So I think these kind of uh, examples are really suitable when you're looking really into benefiting from a network which is passing by yourself and seeing what can I provide to this network and what can I benefit from this network. So kind of uh, interaction dialogue is still uh, probably uh, pending in, in, in Limburg, while in uh, Montabaur, um, uh, the guys have found uh, a way to, to benefit from each other. Thank you. Excellent. And, you know, I, I want to point out there's the, the critics like to say that the high speed line in California should go along Interstate 5 instead of through the cities. Um, and this is one of the cases where, you know, this kind of helped. I'm, I'm very happy that they are building a station in downtown Fresno and downtown Bakersfield and downtown Merced uh, because you have the opportunity like they had in, in Monte Bauer. Uh, 
I also want to point out just another. Uh, absolutely. Example. Maybe I just chime in for a second. Uh, uh, as everything uh, related to high speed rail and transportation is about people and about riders and customers. So uh, I think we, we shouldn't avoid uh, passing by and benefiting from uh, mm -hmm. connecting uh, 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 cities like uh, the ones we have in Bakersfield or Fresno, very uh, well settled and very traditional, and very historic based uh, 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 commun uh, communities that we should uh, serve. And they will also benefit from this uh, approach as well. So kind of, a, uh, and from a also, social uh, uh, point of view, I think high speed rail should also allow for some kind of uh, equity and uh, equal distribution of, of, of opportunities. And maybe the Central Valley for long hasn't been benefiting so much of other regions in California. So connecting them to a high and very uh, well-performing uh, transportation connecting mobility service infrastructure might uh, help uh, them also to uh, jump into modernity, to jump into the uh, opportunities that are uh, ahead of us in the future for the state of California. So it's also a point uh, of uh, social equity, of uh, investing money for the people and helping them to move uh, in and out from their local uh, conditions. Thank you. Yeah, and um, a couple of points there, but going back to this Lindbergh, you know, on weekdays, there are connecting buses that go out to smaller towns. Um, and uh, I had planned on riding that, but I went there on a Sunday and I wasn't there. Uh, but, you know, that does provide tremendous access. In addition to that free bus to downtown, you've got these buses going to other areas as well. So it becomes a good point. Um, and then having driven from Palmdale to LA during afternoon rush hour and being absolutely aghast as to what's happening on that expressway as people are trying to get home from their work in the LA basin up to Palmdale. Um, clearly there's, there's a high need there um, and an exciting opportunity for Palmdale to become a very, very different place. Absolutely. It's yeah. a three to four hours uh, uh, time that they uh, regularly on a weekday spent on behind the wheel to uh, move into LA and back home. So this kind of uh, commute could be really easily uh, be uh, sought out in another way using, for example, uh, high speed rail services. Uh, and um, because high speed rail in his first generation concept was really mainly a kind of substitute of airfares between two highly populated uh, cities. In the second, generation of high-speed rail approach and understanding. We introduced the intermediate stations as well because we understood that the only way to vertebrate and to integrate the network really into the territory is by introducing intermediate stops and connecting uh, them to regional and transit agencies. For example, as you mentioned before, Rick, the, 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 the bus agencies that might bring people really to the last mile and to their final uh, destination to create even not a one seat uh, experience, but at least a multiple seat, but a field door to door service in order to bring people safely uh, home or back uh, to their uh, or point of origin. Thank you. Yes. Um, and then one last from me, if you could go back to the schematic where it has the different floors of this. Yes, this one. Um, so, uh, and I'm also answering David Phillips's question on this. Uh, so up on the top, there are three platforms and six tracks. Two are S-Bahn, uh, where uh, they're kind of like the, in terms of service quality, they're kind of like the Washington Metro. Um, and then four tracks um, serving two platforms are for a mix of high-speed trains, regional trains, and sleeper trains up on, on that top level. And then down on the bottom level, you've got eight tracks on four platforms. Um, and, you know, it's a fairly easy station to, so to, to be specific about David Phillips, there are no through, through tracks. Every, every track and just every train stops. 
Um, but one of the frustrations I have is in this country, our big stations like Chicago Union Station or Washington Union Station, New York Penn, the focus has been on creating that sense of place, kind of at the expense of the rail user, um, which has been very, very frustrating. And um, in this station, uh, Ricky, you talked about getting lost. I had a real hard time finding track one um, in a hurry. Once I calmed down and said, oh, there's another mezzanine, I, I found it. So how do you make sure that you balance out those needs um, in order to make it easy to find the tracks and, and get around? Um, Rick, uh, on this point, I think we still have a long way to improve. Um, it's a very it is, mm, mm, specific station that we have here in Berlin. It's a very high stacked and multi-level uh, vertical oriented uh, uh, system. And when it comes to wayfinding and signage, vertical uh, circulation it turns out to be complicated to communicate to, to the public. It's a, a problem of graphics. It's a problem of identifying the arrows and the, in, in the way of circulating and moving around. Uh, it can be busy, it can be messy, and, and it can be also quite um, complicated to, to navigate and, and circulate uh, across, especially when it is busy and has uh, so, uh, uh, um, um, a special day. But um, uh, some other stations, particularly high-speed rail stations, where we really have uh, really nice circulation areas, neat and clean, uh, with uh, not that many levels. Uh, and particularly when it comes to new stations, which are not terminal stations, which are through stations, it will be easier for, for, for the designer to come up with a clear wayfinding strategy and, uh, um, and guideline to bring the passengers safely quick and uh, without uh, any uh, uh, difficulty throughout the, the facility. I, I agree with you, Berlin can be sometimes a limited complicated in terms uh, because it's mainly oriented vertically rather than horizontally. And horizontally wayfinding is easier to draft, to explain and to guide people through while vertical circulation systems might uh, turn a little bit more complex in terms of uh, guidance and uh, uh, communication uh, purposes. Excellent. Um, this has been great. We're, we're running very low on time. Uh, so typically, uh, we would have Chris ask some questions but, uh, from the audience, but I want to get to one, one more specifically, which is, um, can you talk about what the market for office space next to these uh, different kinds of station is? You know, are they for daily business trips or other uses? Is there residential use? Um, what typically happens with that? Honestly, I, I cannot uh, precisely respond on the real estate uh, situation around uh, Berlin Station. I know it took some time to emerge uh, with them. Uh, it helped to be uh, uh, partners in the development of the district and of the area. The benefit of it is that part of this governmental district didn't collide or be uh, in competition at all with the station's area. So the transitory of the development around the station for, for, for business, for office buildings, and also for uh, housing or accommodation, it's uh, honestly unknown to me where we are, in which way we are uh, really competing or, uh, or not. What we know already is that the staggered and floor and decks uh, of services allows uh, passengers to work very well. If they don't have at all time for uh, shopping, they will remain on the lower uh, ground level for grabbing really uh, uh, on boots in a very short uh, term and very uh, low uh, cost um, uh, level of shopping. When it comes 
uh, to the upper levels. It goes really more into restaurants and boutiques and final into the business uh, for, uh, for working spaces. But how this interacts and collides or competes with the surroundings, honestly, we will have to catch on that and bring some more information Otherwise, at this moment in time, I'm not able to provide you with the with the with the references to to compare um, the situation at the station, the transit or the developments. I only can say that all the parcels that were 15 or 20 years there land banked uh, for future developments by private and public institutions, all of them have been already developed. And so the station area is completely built out already after 20 years. So this may say something of the uh, influence, the well, good influence of the station towards the surroundings and likewise uh, in the in the counterways. Uh, more than that, on figures and numbers, how much of that um, we should have to catch up and bring uh, some more details into the conversation, I guess. For now, I'm not able to bring more details on that. Okay. Um, and then uh, w one last, and if, Chris, while you're asking this, if you can check to see if, if there's any uh, important questions that have been missed. But Kenneth yeah, <laughs> has, a, has an interesting question. Um, apparently, most retail stores in Germany are closed on Sundays. Um, <laughs> is that true also in the railroad stations? Uh, no, uh, well, stations are opened and even on working days, mostly shopping is, uh, ends uh, in many cities by 6 p.m. At the most, at the latest, uh, by 8. Uh, so uh, stations have opened uh, uh, hours until, um, yeah, uh, ending of, uh, of rail services, which is more or less uh, midnight. And... Uh, of course, on week uh, on weekends, or many shops are closed after Saturday, say afternoon. So this is a good catch uh, because then the only option that you might have is to run into the stations and make your shopping uh, that you didn't make it uh, uh, due to these closing hours in the in the regular shopping. So it's a kind of a alternative or an additional offer or service that the stations provide. For, for the public as well. You're right. This is a, a good catch. Uh, offers uh, all wider opening hours than the regular shoppings uh, in the city make uh, for Germany. Excellent. And then Chris, was there anything important that I missed? Um, there, there were several good questions that we won't have time for, but let me ask one uh, from Lois Foster. Maybe this is a good one to wrap up. It's probably a complex topic, but here we go. Um, how close do you think stations in the U.S. will get to the Berlin station model that you've shared today? Are, are there differences that you see between what's planned for stations here in the United States when compared to other countries, or are the principles that you've talked about pretty universal? Hard to compare, as uh, you tend to compare and to tend to uh, just copy and paste many times all over uh, many activities here and in, in, in there between Europe and, and the US. Definitely on the East Coast, I would see really a lot of coincidences and points of contacts between uh, uh, US uh, terminal stations in and in the New York, New York State or Massachusetts, uh, Boston, Pennsylvania, they resemble to me really uh, uh, stations that might be really eligible for be compared or even put at, aside to to the European uh, stations in Paris or in Berlin. So I think they they have grown up to the mo point of of being as uh, as important and as uh, active as the, uh, the European uh, um, folks and, uh, 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 are. Uh, the question turns a little bit more into uh, the second level of stations where we are not talking about terminal big union stations, but rather so the outskirts, so the, the, the commuter uh, train stations, which I feel are lacking of uh, modernization process to bring them into the 21st century. In the US, you will see uh, a lack of 
information at stations are lack actually uh, of safety when it comes to the accessibility because of the lack of at grade separations towards uh, so crossing over the tracks to reach the, the platform and so many things that are basic for the safety and uh, well uh, usage of and governance of stations also what when it comes to safety to security well many stations in the US in the second level of uh, transportation might be a need to be revised and modernized to uh, address the standards that the Europeans were. But to your first question, to the big, big um, union station, terminal stations, and specifically speaking into the uh, East Coast uh, and uh, maybe also uh, other parts of the US, I don't want to, to put it just like that, uh, are certainly at, at the level of, of, of competition. I might find that they have a lot of spare spaces, but they don't know exactly what to do with them. For example, in Chicago, where the in station uh, has really so much open opportunities, or LA Metro, where the underground stations don't have any retail at all, where the, we, and you see the space uh, for that. And so you figure out why not uh, taking into uh, account this uh, kind of opportunity. So I think uh, there is a lack of initiatives sometimes uh, around these uh, facilities. And so they are not so vibrant. They are not so attractive for the public as they could be. But uh, apart of that, I think uh, many stations uh, cope for, for the best and, and have here uh, a, a huge uh, attractiveness, appearingness to be, especially the union spaces that are currently revised and modernized by by Amtrak and the, with the state and uh, federal funds. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you both for coming. This has been very, very interesting. Uh, we really appreciate all that that uh, DB has done this year um, in terms of providing these presentations, and this was. Uh, uh, an excellent addition. And thank you all in the audience for joining us today. Um, again, um, if you want fast, frequent, and affordable trains across the country, uh, please go to highspeedrail.us and hit the donate or join button. And uh, please join us again very soon for our next show. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.